So unbelievers say there need to remember that show kids say the darndest things. Yeah. There needs to be a show called Unbelievers Say the Darndest Things. Because <laughs> unbelievers sometimes say the craziest, wackiest stuff. Such as, I've heard people say, I'd rather reign in hell than serve in heaven. I'm sure, I'm sure you've heard that before. No. No, you haven't? Well, talk to a few atheists. Wait, who said that? One of our uncles. Oh, sure. Of yeah. course. Probably more than one. Um, I'd rather reign in hell. And, and so what people mean when they say that is that they look. They rather be a king in hell, than be a servant in heaven. That's sort of the the, the the idea. And when I was growing up in high school, sometimes people would say, "All the fun people are in hell, right?" Like I'd rather go to hell and party with Biggie and Tupac, than go to heaven and be with Mother Teresa. And they would name all these other so-called holy people, you know, who are boring and lame or whatever. So, people really believe these fallacious nonsensical tropes they really think i believe hell is going to be a party where they're going to sip on cristal and dom perignon all day with their favorite rappers and that heaven's going to be this snooze fest this boring cringe place where everyone sits cross-legged and sips on an apple juice uh, and doesn't say any curse words or, or whatever they're they're thinking is with this and of course they believe that those lies because satan has deceived them to believe those lies the truth is that christ like we sang is reigning even now and the bible says has bound satan the truth is that the gospel message is like paul says in romans 1 the power of god for salvation to all who believe and the truth is the devil is in chains and is weak. And all he has is lies. That's all he can do is really lie to you. And lie to others and cause... What, does, what do lies do? They just cause chaos. Because truth is order, lies is chaos. All we have to do really easier said than done because of the complexities of sin in our life uh, but all we really have to do is proclaim this message this gospel christ died and rose from the dead god will do the rest but as human beings we want to fix everything ourselves we see a problem and think well it can't be as simple as just proclaiming the word of god and being faithful there has to be more i have to be able to put my hands to something and fix it myself and that's a, that's a temptation we all face and all give in to, I think, from time to time. So the truth is, there really is no reigning in hell unless by reigning you mean sulfur from the sky. <laughs> but there is no reigning, R-E-I-G-N. That's a weird way to spell reigning with a G. English is such a weird language. But there is no reigning in hell. Only torment in the realization that you were lied to and were deceived. How many people will have this horrifying moment when they realize, I believe the lie, and there's no going back. I'm doomed. There's no going back. Forever. So don't be deceived this morning. Instead, embrace Christ. Reign with Him now, so that you might reign with Him forever. There's no reigning with Christ unless you reign with him now. So there's two options set before you. Christ and life or Satan and death. Might be too simplistic for some, but this is really what we have set before us. So choose this day, this day whom you will serve. Revelation 20 verses 1 to 3 reads like this. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit in a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit and shut it and sealed it over him so that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. So, whether you know it or not, we have landed upon one of the most contested passages 
in all of the book of Revelation and maybe even the Bible. Chapter 20 of the infamous millennial reign. Some of you might be familiar with these terms, pre-millennial, amillennial, post-millennial. Um, maybe you're not familiar, but these terms are, aren't really that important. What's important is the meaning of what the text says. So let's figure this out. An angel descends from heaven with the key to the bottomless pit in the great chain. So this is an angel who's ready to uh, break, put someone in custody. Some cosmic custody, some cosmic jail time here. And this key to the bottomless pit is a reference to the, the same key we've heard about uh, Jesus is said to have, namely the key of David, the key to death in Hades. And this angel seizes the dragon. He's basically a cosmic police officer at this point, a righteous police officer. And he arrests the dragon. And the dragon, we know, is the serpent, that ancient serpent, the devil and Satan. And there's some debate among scholars who, are, who say things like the serpent isn't the same entity as the devil or Satan. And there's some debate. But this sort of ends the debate because it literally defines the dragon as that ancient serpent, the devil and Satan. Now some have said, and Satan? See, there's another one. No, uh, the word Satan means accuser. So, you can read this as the ancient ser serpent, the devil, and the accuser. It's the same person. So, he binds the devil for a thousand years and throws him into a pit and seals it so that he might not deceive the nations any longer. So, that is the key to understanding this. Th that phrase, that he might not deceive, deceive is the key word, the nations. It's not that the devil is completely obliterated. See, some people read this and think, see, the devil's gone. No, he's not completely obliterated. He's bound. If you bind somebody with chains on their wrists and their feet, they're, they're still able to move a bit. They're just, uh, what's the word? Um, limited in what they can do now. They're not completely free. They're bound. And many have said this, this thousand year period will be a period of perfect peace where there's going to be no trouble or no sin on the earth. But notice it doesn't say that. It doesn't say that. It simply says the devil is bound from deceiving the nation. So uh, I, I can't understand how we can be consistent with this passage and understand the thousand years as literal thousand years, a thousand years. Literally every other image in this passage is figurative. Okay. Every other image is figurative. We're, an angel is not going to come from heaven with a chain and, and bind the spirit being and throw him into a physical pit. We know the, these are metaphorical uh, words describing a spiritual thing. Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 8, But do not overlook this one fact, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So the days of Genesis have been understood by some as prophetic 1,000-year epochs. I'm not sure if the word is epoch or epic. I don't know how. Some say epoch. I'm going to say epoch. If that's the case, and many ancient commentators believe it is the case, then this is obviously the 1,000 years here is also spoken of in, in, a, in a figurative prophetic sense. The 1,000-year millennium is... I believe, to interpret consistently, the church age, the time between the resurrection of Christ and his second coming. So we are currently living in the millennial age, but you might be thinking, Alan, it doesn't seem like the millennial age. It doesn't seem like the devil is bound from deceiving the nations, does it? This is what Jesus meant when he said, the kingdom of God is in your midst. Was he right? When he said that? Yes. Good answer. <laughs> when Jesus came and inaugurated his ministry, the kingdom of God, he said, had come. It was there. It was presence. When he healed, when he cast out demons, the kingdom of God was assaulting the kingdom of darkness in that moment. When Jesus healed people, I want you to understand those healings as an act of war against the devil. That's what Jesus was doing when he came. When he healed people, when he cast out demons, when he did these things, 
we we read it and we get warm and fuzzy feelings we go oh jesus is our healer and he is <laughs> but i want you to understand the other side of the coin here it's not <clears throat> jesus doesn't come to heal you just because he's a nice guy and you know he really wants to heal you specifically what he's doing is coming and declaring war on the devil and saying this territory you have reign over now is is gone i'm taking it by force and the sin and the destruction that has been enacted because of the lies of the devil, sickness and death and demon possession and all this stuff, all this stuff that has happened as a result of the devil's lies, Jesus comes and he reverses it. And by reversing it, he takes custody of that kingdom. He, he, he takes it by force. It's an act of spiritual war. Look at what Jesus says in Matthew 12, 29. He says... Oh, look, I just got a free ticket to the Thank God for Bitcoin conference. That's nice. <laughs> um, Matthew 12, 29, uh, he says, Or how can someone enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man? There's that word bind or bound, as it, as it says in Revelation. Then indeed he may plunder his house. Jesus is literally saying, I have come bound the strong man who is metaphorically the devil in this in this context he binds the strong man and he plunders his house so jesus uses this illustration of i'm coming into the devil's house i'm binding him in chains and i'm taking all that is his i'm, I'm taking it for myself i'm plundering it for me he's binding him he's plundering him this is why he was able to cast out demons and also give that same authority to his disciples. How could... Okay, it's one thing that... I get it. The God comes to earth and he has authority to cast out demons and to tell spirits what to do and they obey. Makes perfect sense. Makes perfect sense. But then when he comes to his disciples and says, Alright, I'm giving you the authority to do that. Well... Then they do it, except they fail one time. But most of the times they have success. He's able to give authority to others to do the same thing because he's spreading his kingdom. So here's his kingdom people, and he says, I'm giving you my authority to go and do the works I do to continue to spread my kingdom. Now, was Satan still at work? No. Yes, he was. <laughs> one for one, or one for two. Pretty good, pretty good. Technically, yes, but was he bound? Yes, yes, he was now bound. In Jesus' name, he was bound. He was not, he did not get free reign any longer. This is what the passage is saying. Satan is bound. In Jesus' name, he's bound. Now, think about this. A lot of people uh, of, in the charismatic circles say this a lot. I bind you, Satan, right? You've heard that. I bind you, Satan. Well, he's already bound, <laughs> right? You don't really have to say it. It's, it's, it's. It's a reality. You, if it makes you feel better, say it. I bind you, Satan. Okay, fine. But it's like, it's like telling someone in jail, I, I put you in jail. It's like, well, okay. It's kind of rubbing it in their face, so I guess that's fine. But they're already there. They're bound. They're in jail. It's, it's what it is. He's bound. So think about this. Look how far this gospel has come. Look how far. It may look like the gospel is losing ground in this country but the gospel of jesus still has power to save today and the devil can't stop it he can go out and deceive the nations by lying but god's word is still going forward i mean what happened to us at the park is an example um how did they get rid of us force. well yeah force but the force was predicated on a lie Right? It was a lie. All they did was come in, lie, 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 and bully, bully, bully. And this is the tactic of the devil. Lies and bullying and uh, dishonest tactics of war. That's all, the, that's all they can do. They can, they can, I mean, I guess they could lock us up. They could even kill us. But we know that to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So it is what it is. Jesus is still actively plundering the strong man's house because Satan, the strong man, is bound. He's still bound, and Jesus is still plundering. So we're in this 
if you want to think of the church age, uh, there's so many illustrations, but this is a good one. Think of the age we live in now as, as Jesus being in the house of the devil and the devil's bound, but he's still screaming lies and kind of squirming around and Jesus is just plundering it. He's plundering it. He's plundering it. And as he plunders you and takes you, he, he kind of gives you the authority now. So go and plunder too. Go and take. Go and in my name uh, uh, rescue more. So yes, this beast system pro proliferates through the world. But has the gospel light been snuffed out? No, it hasn't. This message that started in Jerusalem with a few hundred people ballooned to 3,000 on day one. Good day one, right? 3,000 people. And now there is scarcely a place on earth where the name of Jesus is not and has not been proclaimed. So don't be too discouraged by what you see because the gospel is winning and the gospel will win. Satan is bound and because of his death and resurrection, that's Jesus, he, Christ makes us to reign with him now in life and in death. Verse number 4. Uh, four, two, where am I going? Ten. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those of, uh, to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison, and he will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea, and they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints, in the beloved city but fire came down from heaven and consumed them and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever so now the scene moves to heaven where john again sees thrones and seated on them are those who have authority to judge so we're again taking a peek into god's throne room here but now John sees another group in the throne room. He sees souls. Key word, souls. The souls of those who have been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and the word of God. Also among them were the souls of those who had not worshipped the beast or received its mark. So let's do the math. Who is the group? The saints. God's people. We're told they came to life and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So... What's being communicated here? Is this a physical resurrection on earth John is seeing? No, I don't think so. It doesn't say that they came to life and reigned with Christ on the earth. This is a spiritual life. He's talking about the new birth. Notice it says this is the first resurrection. First resurrection? There's more than one? Technically, yes. Because when you're born again, what does the Bible say? You have been raised to life with Christ in the heavenly places, right? Very easy to read this and and think it's 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 a physical resurrection. It's this one is not the physical resurrection. This is the spiritual, the new birth resurrection because there is a second resurrection that's physical, right? There is. But this one this is not speaking of that resurrection. This is speaking of being raised to life with Christ and reigning with him for a thousand years. So what the implication is, when you're born again, you begin reigning with Christ now. And then when you die, you continue reigning with him forever. So this reigning with Christ doesn't have a end point. It starts with the new birth, and it just continues forever. It, there's transitions, right, from, from this body to, the, to a new body. Sure, there's transitions, but it doesn't end. They reigned with him. We reign with him. Ephesians 2, 5 to 7, even when we were dead in our trespasses, God made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches 
of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. So God made us alive with Christ, raised us up with him, seated us with him where? In heavenly places. It's kind of weird to think about that you in this moment spiritually are seated with Christ in heavenly places. But it's true. We, we reign with him throughout the whole millennium because the millennium is the age where he comes and plunders the strong man's house. This is the first resurrection, the new birth. Over such, look at this. This is this is wild when I read this in this context. Over such, the second death has no power. The second death has no power. But the first death can still take us. But that doesn't really matter because the only death that really matters is the second death. The second death is the one you don't want to have happen to you <laughs> or endure. The first death comes to all men. The second death doesn't. Because those who are in Christ, we're told there's no power in the second death towards them. The rest of the dead did not come to life until after the thousand years. Why? Because the rest of the dead are those not in Christ who will come to life and be judged and cast into the lake of fire, as we'll read later. So what happens when the thousand years are over? Well, it says Satan is released. The story of Satan's final demise has been told and retold several times in the book of Revelation. I feel like I'm saying it almost every week. But essentially, he's unbound to be destroyed. It's, like, it's almost like God releases him from prison just to knock him down once and for all. This is part of the mystery of God's sovereign will. When he, re he releases Satan from his chains, he allows him to go out and deceive the nations, to gather against the people of God, the church. The final end time war against God's people. All the nations will turn against God's people. They'll march over the broad plain of the earth, surround the camp of the saints. What does that mean? Does it mean all the earth, like, are all Christians going to be centralized in a one physical location and then all the armies are going to physically surround them? Is this what it's describing here? Like, I've seen this in Left Behind, maybe one through four. I don't know which version it was, but there was uh, this, this scene. This is a coordinated effort to eradicate the name of Jesus from the face of the earth. And notice, it's met with swift destruction. It doesn't last long. It doesn't last long. Fire comes down from heaven and consumes them all. Remember what fire represents. Do you remember, Henry? I remember. What, what's fire represent? Yeah, I remember by Okay. The Word of God. <laughs> it's the Word of God. The Word of God. Yes. So Is this not an allusion to Sodom? Is this not an allusion to Sodom? The wicked sinners surround the camp of the saints right they surround the house of lot and, and the angels then then, then the, the 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 wicked sodomites try to violate the angels in the house and and when they surround the house what happens they're blinded and lot escapes and then fire rains down and consumes them all look at what jude 1 says six to seven and the angels who did not stay within their own position of authority but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the great judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example, there it is, by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. So you see, he's kept them in chains until the judgment day, bound and Sodom's judgment of fire serves as an example of what's coming. So some might say, well, why is Satan released? Why not just keep him bound? Why not give him an eternal sentence in that state? Well, one, because his binding is not his total destruction. Jesus releases him for one reason. You might think, boy, why, why release him? To destroy him. That's why. Because if he's if he's bound forever, he could still lie and cause mischief in this way. So Jesus releases him to destroy him. 
It's like when an uh, inmate gets the death sentence, right? He's in the he's in the prison, but in order to destroy him, you have to release him, right? Got to let him out. You got to take the chains off and administer the uh, the death. And in this case, the it's not the electric chair. In this case, it's the lake of fire. There it is, Sodom language again, where the beast and the false prophet were. So what's going on here? Christ is judging the unholy trinity. He's throwing them into the lake of fire. And it says they will be tormented day and night forever and ever and ever. This is the curtain call finito. That's Spanish, right? Yes. No. No. It's not. What is it then? Why do, why do people say it? I don't know. What is, what is it in Spanish? Well, I don't know. In Argentina, we say, se acabó. Yeah. Like it's, done. Well, it's that. <laughs> it's that for the devil. Is this literal fire and sulfur? Hard to say. Don't know. The, the, this, this lake of fire is described as a lake of fire. It's described as fire and sulfur. It's described as uh, uh, darkness. It's described as the pit. It's described in all these different ways. So I'm not going to sit here and presume to know exactly what eternal damnation is like but just take all the images fire a lake of fire fire from heaven eternal darkness bind it all up into one thing and you don't want to go there you don't want to go there it echoes daniel 12 daniel 12 2 says and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt so if the life, because people say, well, it's not eternal. It's just like eternal death, meaning you just cease to exist. Okay, if you want to hold that position, I guess I don't buy it. And this is why I don't buy it. If the life is everlasting, then the contempt and shame is also everlasting. Because Daniel uses the same language. So unless you want to say that the life Jesus gives you doesn't last forever, just sort of a very long time that eventually ends, it doesn't make sense. If the life is everlasting, so is the contempt. Verse 11. What of the rest of the dead? What about the rest? Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence the earth and sky fled away. And no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they have done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The great white throne enters the scene and one seated on it whom earth and sky fled from. Wow. The great white throne judgment. Why does creation flee from his presence? Because his beef is not with creation. His beef is with sinners. So when he shows up to judge, the creation basically says this. This is none of my business. <laughs> I'm going to just leave because I don't belong here. The day of reckoning had, has come and the judge has taken his seat and his gavel is in his hand. And all the dead from great and small were standing before the throne. Great and small, where have we heard that phrase? Revelation 13, all great and small, rich and poor, took the mark of the beast. What does this phrase mean? It means it doesn't matter what your status is, whether you're rich or poor, great, or small, doesn't matter. If you take the mark of the beast, you receive its rewards. And the books were open, the book of life, and the proceedings are quite simple. Okay, who are you? Nope, not here. See ya. If your name is not in the book, you're done. Finished. The sea gave up the dead. Death and Hades gave up the dead. And they were all done finished according to what was written in the books and because of jesus resurrection those who are in him don't go to hades listen this judgment seat no christians are there there's no christians there this is only those 
who serve the beast. This is their judgment time. I talked to a well-known lawyer about the incident at the park there, and he told me, Alan, you know, you could sue these people. You could. But despite the fact that they're in the wrong and you're in the right, you're going to lose. You're still going to lose. Just understand that. And then I asked him, so what you're saying, why didn't, yeah, I guess it was a question. I said, so what you're saying is, at this point in the game, they're just making it up as they go, the rules. And he said, pretty much, that's how it works in our justice system now. They just kind of make it up. The courts and judgment seats of man are corrupt. Maybe not all of them, but in this country, let's face it, they're corrupt. But should we be surprised that the courts of men are corrupt? My only consolation in this life is that God's court is not corrupt. That's it. That's my only consolation. There's a courtroom in heaven that will come to earth. And when it does, earth is going to peace out. I'm out. Don't want none of this. And he will do the right thing. No one will receive an unjust sentence. When that gavel slams down, the verdict will be perfect. And as the Bible says, justice will flow like a river and righteousness like a spring. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire to join Satan in the false prophets and the beast. My kids often ask, will God punish the bad people? Yes, <laughs> he will. With a perfect, just punishment. But for those in Christ, you reign with him now and forever. But for those who follow the devil, it's the lake of fire. Now that's not comfortable for some. I don't want you to think about, well, people will say, I don't want to think about God doing this. Eternal punishment seems a bit too much. But this has to happen to pave the way for eternal life. Everyone wants to imagine eternal peace. Everyone wants to imagine heaven. Everybody wants it. We want restored Eden. We want the tears wiped away from the eyes. We want no more death and no more sickness and no more pain. Everyone wants that. But no one wants to destroy the devil. Everybody wants to be a bodybuilder. No one wants to lift heavy weights. <laughs> Everyone wants eternal life. No one wants to destroy the devil. Guys, it, it, you can't have your cake and eat it too in this scenario. You can't have one without the other. You want to reign with Christ, but you don't want his enemies to be destroyed? It's not going to work. Arise, O Lord, let your enemies flee. Well, the great day is coming. People need to know the king is coming and to bow the knee to him now. Because despite what you might have heard, eternal life doesn't start in heaven. It starts now. It starts now. When you're born again. If you aren't seated with Christ in heaven now. You won't be seated with him then. The urgency is there. If you don't know Christ. Turn from your sin. Trust him today. Reserve your heavenly seats. That's kind of a inappropriate way to say it. Because you're not really reserving anything. He is. But you get the, you get the idea. <laughs> he will not cast you out if you come to him. If you come to Christ and say Lord please help me. Forgive me. Do you think he's going to say no? No. Oh, he's going to say yes. I receive you. But if you continue in your stubborn rebellion for the sake of his justice and the peace of his kingdom, he has to, he has to eradicate you. He has to do it. And it's right and loving to do that. So Christian, rejoice in this master of yours. He fights for you. He gives you a seat to reign on with him. And that's incredible. I was asked the other day, what's your relationship with God like? I thought, boy, that's a good question. And I had to think for a minute. And my answer was, I, my relationship with the Father is like a father. He's my father. I'm the son. And I feel like I can go to him with anything. And he's ready to hear me and receive me and love me and teach me. But my relationship with Jesus is a little bit different than with the Father. My relationship with Jesus is like an older brother who defends me, who who has my back, who walks with me, who uh, is loyal and loving and receives me. This is Jesus. 
He fights for you. He's, he's your, he's your, the Bible calls him your elder brother. That's what it says. That's good news. And the Holy Spirit is like an old wise grandpa who is just there saying, Hey, hey boy, hey girl, this is the way. This is not the way. Follow this way, not that way. I don't know if that's a proper understanding of the Holy Spirit, but it is how I, my relationship with him. So if you reject him now, tremble in fear. Your rebellion will not be swept under the rug forever. Forsake your sin and embrace the Lord today in Jesus' name. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Revelation. We've come so far into it. Two more sermons left. I can't believe it. So much has happened between Revelation 1 and today. I pray that it has been a blessing thus far and that you continue to lift our spirits to the heavenly places and show us your grace and your love and your care for us and your justice and your protection and all that stuff. So help us, Lord. We need you desperately every day. And uh, we ask you to keep us in your care until you come again or you take us. In Jesus' name, amen.